Welcome to the FaithBridge Sermon Podcast. We hope you're encouraged by the message. For more in-depth content and answers to questions submitted during the sermon, check out our podcast called Postscript. You can find it on iTunes or on our website at faithbridge.org forward slash podcast. Welcome to FaithBridge. Glad that you are here today. We're starting in on a new series where we're going to talk about marriage. If you were here last week, you will remember that we had a, a very powerful time of healing prayer at the conclusion of the service. And I got to talk to some of the prayer partners afterwards. Consistently, they said one of the most prayed uh, requested prayer uh, requests among people that came forward were the, was the request, pray for my marriage. We see that regularly, weekly, when you turn in your prayer cards, the perforated cards on your bulletins, pray for our marriage, pray for our marriage, pray for our marriage. And so every two to two and a half years, we try to swing in and do a little series just talking specifically about it. And that's what we're going to do today and the next two Sundays. So I'm really glad that you're here as we're starting. Now, I realize going in that there are about as many single people on the campus as there are married people on the campus today. And I want to just kind of intercept a thought that might be going through your mind right now. That thought being, ah, gosh, why did I come today? And I probably won't come the next two days, uh, next two Sundays, <clears throat> because this is for married people, right? I want to challenge you. I want to challenge you to rethink that. And in fact, I'm going to give you a guarantee if you're single, and that is what we talk about today will be incredibly relevant and applicable to your life this afternoon. I didn't just say you're going to get married this afternoon, but you will have something that you can use this afternoon, tomorrow, and the next day. In fact, it'll be useful for you even if you choose never to get married your whole life, all right? So don't tune out, tune in. Now, people tend to ask the deepest questions about marriage, not on the front end. On the front end, that's when everything's happy, that's when everything is blissful. When they're newlyweds, that's not when they're asking the deep questions. They ask the deep questions when they're in the deep weeds and when they're up to their eyeballs in frustration. That tends to be when couples begin to ask questions all the time about who is this person. Used to just seem like we just, we just understood stood each other, we communicated so naturally together, there was just this attraction and magnetism and chemistry, and it was just like we knew each other before we even met each other, and it just fit together so perfectly, and then we got married, and after a little while, it was like, who is this stranger? That's what consistently we see to happen. You go down the pike a little bit fast further, and you begin to see something else that begins to slip into people's minds, and that is this thought, hmm. Maybe I married the wrong person. Maybe I married the wrong one. Now I want to identify a huge myth that's gliding along the subterranean of your soul if you've ever thought that, okay? Here's the myth. The myth is it shouldn't be this hard. Marriage just shouldn't be this difficult. That's the myth. It just shouldn't be this hard. Hard. You ever thought that? It shouldn't be this hard. You ever thought that to yourself? Sure you have. All of us have thought that from time to time, right? Now, I want to ask this question, though. Why do we think that? Why do we think it shouldn't be this hard? Picture in your mind J.J. Watt, okay? Houston Texans, great. And, you know, he, he, you picture him with, like, last year, the blood <laughs> kind of coming down his forehead and where he just hits people so hard with his helmet. And, and, <clears throat> and now just picture this. Picture yourself just walking up to him and saying, you know, J.J., we just appreciate how hard you're working and you're just slapping down all those balls and, and tackling all those quarterbacks. You know, but it just shouldn't be that hard. It just shouldn't be that hard for you. If you were to do that, he would roll his eyes and he would chuckle and he would look at you and say, yeah, well, that's why they're paying me $100 million and not you $100 million because it is hard and I'm willing to get up at three in the morning and go to the gym and work at it. And all of Houston loves him for it. 
Or picture this. Picture the person who says, you know, I just really want to win the Yard of the Month award in, in my neighborhood. All right? Suppose that that's a high value for you. But suppose also that person says, yeah, but I'm not going to mow. I'm not going to weed. I'm not going to garden. I'm not going to water. I'm not going to fertilize. I'm not going to do any of that. I just want to win the award. Just bring it on. Give it to me. Of course, that's silly. Nobody would do that. Why? Because if you're going to win that award, you're going to be out there on your hands and knees and spoon feeding each blade of grass, and you're, you're going to be bringing your yard along. You don't win that without some hard work, right? Or even this past week, my little guy, he's, uh, he just turned seven last week. And so he's just starting to hook the phonetic sounds up. And the, the reading is, is starting to get some traction. And, and, but he was having a hard time spelling the word eight, E-I-G-H-T, the number eight. And he was so frustrated because we kept saying eight and he would spell it wrong. And I said, no, not that. And then she said, finally, after four or five times, he was just so exasperated. He flung himself into the sofa and he says, I don't care how to spell the number eight anyways. I'll just spell it like this. <laughs> and I heard Suzanne say to him, honey, I know it's hard now, but trust me, someday you're going to be really glad you learned how to spell the number eight. Okay, so why is it that we think things should just come easily to it? Nothing comes. If you've ever had anything meaningful, making progress along in your life, it was because you were putting in some work, right? There's just nothing in life where you can just stop, prop up your feet and stop working and, and just expect to see progress. It doesn't work that way. So why do we think it should work that way when it comes to marriage? This should just be so easy. I'll tell you why we think that. The reason why we think that is because we are all so saturated and infected by the media that is so prevalent in our culture. The books we read, the films we watch, you, 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 just, you just look at, the, you know, all you got to do is just watch a two-hour film. And they get it all worked out, and it's happy, and it's easy, and it's romantic. and it's, that, that, yeah, I'll take one of those. That's what I want. That's what we do, right? And, and yet, if you were to get back just a little bit in history, just were to go back 100 years, let's just say 1914, and any time earlier than that, you know what you would find? You would find, wow. Culture has really embraced a superficiality in the last hundred years, really the last 50 particularly, that is hard to measure. Because you go back a hundred years and what you would find is that people knew back then, of course marriage is hard. Of course it's going to be difficult. Of course it'll have some great highs. It'll be wonderful. And, but there'll be some great painful lows as well. In fact, in a day where there was inferior medicine and, and no antibiotics, and it, people got married pretty well knowing, you know, maybe one or maybe even two of our kids may even die. They just signed up knowing that's, that's just going to be part of of it. They knew marriage was going to mean sacrificing for one's spouse and one's children and one's community and the world. And, but they just thought back then, well, of course it is. That's just the, that's normal. That's the noble way to live. What could be nobler than living out our lives with that type of sacrifice for our families and for our communities? But not today. People today, we pick up this totally different message and it should just be easy, we say to ourselves, it's a myth, and we have bought it. We swallowed it. Hook, line, sink. We've fallen for it. In fact, I was just pondering, what if, I just wondered, obviously you can't do it, but what if we could just bring some people up here from a previous generation, and they could live again and talk to us about marriage for just a few minutes? You know, I have a sneaking suspicion they would tell us straight up, you people in 2014, psh, you, are you kidding? Would you just think it was, it was just going to be so easy? You people in 2014, you all are so superficial. You're just a bunch of crybaby wimps. You just need to grow up. Quit complaining. Get to work. That's what it's always been. 
That's what marriage has always been. Because see, people back then understood what we don't understand. Namely, that on wedding day, two people don't just go into the chapel and get married. They walk straight from the chapel into the gymnasium. Never to come out of character building. That's what marriage is. You've entered into the gymnasium of character building where you're gonna learn how to care for and how to love and how to connect and all the things with this person that seems so much like you on the front end, but the more in you go, the more mysterious many times he or she feels to you. I remember when I first experienced this, just right when we got back from our honeymoon and uh, the first morning we were back from our honeymoon, I slipped out of bed and went out and got the coffee going and, and had my coffee and sat down in my chair and had my prayer time and devotions and, and did some reading. Uh, and then I went out to my study and did some work and finally I'd done about everything I could think to do. And so I walked into the, to the bedroom and I said, all right, baby, come on, let's get up. Honeymoon's over. And, and she said, shh. And I said, Why? It's just us too. And, and she said, no, shh, for me, you're talking too loud. And, and, and it didn't make any sense to me whatsoever because I'm thinking, well, baby, it's, it's November in Houston. It's sunny. It's cool. Mornings don't come along like this much in Houston. Let's get up and enjoy it. The breeze is blowing. The birds are chirping. We're married. Let's, let's get up and enjoy it. And she kept saying, be, you should be quiet. Quiet, be quiet. And finally, I just sat down on the bed and I thought, you're just not getting it. And, and I said, I said, baby, did, did you never learn the early bird gets the worm? You ever heard that one? The early bird gets the worm? And I said, baby, no, didn't you ever learn that the most productive, efficient people throughout all of history, with the exception of Winston Churchill, always were early risers and they always maximized the hours between 5 and 8 a.m. Because if you maximize the hours between 5 and 8 a.m., you have just zoomed three hours hours ahead of the rest of the world while they're snoozing. <laughs> and she looked at me and said, please stop talking. <laughs> and it was in that moment I went, oh, I've married one of the rest of the world. <laughs> and then that evening, when it was about time to start powering down and you know getting ready for bed, a respectable hour, about eight, <laughs> eight fifteen, something like that. She started talking and she started telling me all these things. Oh, I've looked for it all day. I was going to tell you this and this. And blah, 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 blah. She was telling me all these things and 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 I'm brushing my teeth. And I'm just feeling kind of tired and so I, I'm lying down in bed, but I'm still trying to tune in because I want to be a good husband because I'm a new husband. I want to be a good husband. and So I'm acting like I'm really interested and, and, and hanging in there as she's telling her stories. And, and, and But finally, I wasn't really interested. I was feeling kind of woozy and, and discombobulated. And finally, I said something to her about Chinese water torture. And then she started crying and she started saying, I waited 30 years to have this to be married to an uncaring husband. And I said, no, no, no. I'm tremendously caring. You got one of the good guys right here. Just let me prove it to you in the morning. We, you know, we've been going, I still have not got her fixed. <laughs> we've been at it for years and she hadn't fixed me either. So we go into marriage, don't we? With these ideas of how we're just going to glide into it so easily. And then we find out, uh oh, it's not that easy. Sometimes we feel like my gosh, this person is crazy that I'm married to. Now, let me tell you why marriage is hard work. Here's why it's hard work. Here's why it's not easy. Here's why we gotta just shoot holes through that myth that it should be easy. Here's why. Because whenever you take two people and you marry them together and you put them under the same roof, you can be absolutely, totally certain that both of those two people are positively, undeniably sinners. They both are. And what happens when you take two people 
who are undeniably sinful and you put them under the same roof and you say, now you two just get along well, they're together. It's inevitable. They're going to say things that are hurtful and confusing to the other person. They're going to do things that are hurtful and confusing to the other person, right? They're going to disappoint the other person. They're going to let the other person. You're going to get aware of the fact she's not as perfect as I once thought. He's not as perfect as I once thought. In fact, I think he's a sinner. I think she's a sinner. You're going to get to realize that. And see, Satan comes along, who's always been in the business of stealing, killing, and destroying, and he would love nothing more than to fan the flames of those thoughts, bringing people in their minds to a point of utter despair and the, the, the certainty deep within their soul, this thing is only going one direction. It's going down, down, down. It's just going to get worse. That's what the devil has always been in the business of trying to get married people to think. So is there hope? Absolutely there's hope. <laughs> the God of the universe, can the God of the universe bring transformation? Yes. Can the same Jesus who turned water into wine come along and do a miracle in a marriage? Yes. In fact, we get the front row view, those of us who work around. I've got to see it happen time and time again. And I'm telling you, there are few things as inspiring than seeing two people who are really about at wit's end and they're unraveling in their marriage, but then they wake up and they realize, wow, this is hard. And they say, we're gonna have to work on this, just like we have to work on our parenting, just like we're gonna have to work on our gardening, just like we're gonna have to work on our budgeting, just like we're gonna have to work on anything. And they realize that and they roll up their sleeves and they start to work on it. And we've got to see, I've got to see personally, Hundreds of marriages that have moved from the bitterest of juice to the sweetest of honey because two people said, we're going to work on this. Is transformation possible? Absolutely it is. You say, all right, well, then how do we get there? Well, you'll need to come back the next two Sundays, all right? So, not really. Well, kind of really, uh, because there's no way that we can really cover everything that we want to cover in just this morning. So I do hope that you'll be back the next two weeks. Um, but I'm going to give you one thought for today. Just one thought, simple sermon. If though you'll let your mind really metabolize this thought, I'm telling you, it will blow your mind and it will change your marriage. If you'll let this one sink in. Before doing so, though, let me give credit where credit is due. Gary Thomas is a friend of Faithbridge. He's a writer and a speaker, an author, and he has been, well, he's preached here at Faithbridge several times over the years, and he's led several uh, training events with our staff uh, as well. And several years ago, Lisa and he moved from the Pacific Northwest to Houston. And so Suzanne and I have actually had the good fortune of b just becoming friends and pals with Gary and Lisa and getting to, to know them on a personal level. Well, a few months ago, we were talking and he said, you know, I'm, I'm writing a new book on marriage. Now, first, I should tell you, he has already written the gold standard on parenting and the gold standard on marriage. In fact, if, if you don't have sacred parenting or sacred marriage, you, you, do, you do not have what most in Christian circles consider kind of the gold standard for parenting and marriage. So he's uh, saying, I'm, I'm writing another book on marriage. I'm like, you're kidding me. You got more? And the other one was so good. And, and, and he said, I do. I said, well, send it to me, would you? I want to read your draft. Um, and so he sent it to me and I got to read it while I was up in the mountains over the summer. And I wrote, I emailed him and said, Gary, this is amazing. Now you've written two gold standards on marriage. This is challenging. It's convicting. It's inspiring. It's fresh. It's, it's just so, so good. It's called Lifelong Love. Now, here's the deal. It doesn't release until October 1st, but we were able to work out a deal with the publisher and they shipped to us five 
boxes that arrived two or three days ago. And so after the service, I'm going to encourage you, go out to the resource center at the right side out in the lobby as you walk out of either center court where you're sitting. It's called A Lifelong Love. What if marriage is about more than just staying together by Gary Thomas. And here's a bonus. Not only can you get it but uh, early, but you can get it for cheaper. They made us a really good deal. And so we're selling them for $12. Okay, good hardback book. So there you go. I mentioned that to you simply because there's no way that Pastor Dan and I can cover uh, in three messages. I'll do the first and third. He'll do the middle one. Uh, But all of this, but there's so many good things. I want to give you one of them today as we get going along um, in this series. Okay, the one big idea, here it is. If you would start to see your spouse as God sees your spouse, your relationship will never be the same. Write that one down. You say, but that's pretty simple. Oh, you know, we'll, we'll unpack it. It's not quite as simple as you think. If you would start to see your spouse as God sees your spouse, your relationship will never be the same. Here's the text, the biblical text. It's a one verse sermon. 1 John 3, 1. See what kind of love the Father has lavished upon us that we should be called the children of God. And that is what we are. Gary writes, when I was a young husband, during an intense time of prayer, I sensed God telling me very directly that Lisa wasn't just my wife, but she was also his daughter. And that I was to treat her accordingly. It was an intense application of First John 3, 1. There's a gal in our church, her name is Kathleen. And a year or so ago, Suzanne and I realized that we had a little predicament. Um, One of our kids needed to be on this side of the city and the other kid needed to be on this side of the city at different times and all that. And and I'm here at at church working during the the days and and Suzanne can't be two places at at once. And so we said, Kathleen, could we give you a little moonlighting job and you just help us get the kids where they need to be at the right place at the right time and all that? And she said, yeah, sure, I'd be glad to do that. Well, it was just a solution to a problem when it started, but it didn't take very long before I noticed something. I noticed that the kids started quoting Kathleen. They said, well, you know, Kathleen said this and Kathleen said that. And they would tell stories that she was relaying from her own life experiences. And it didn't take very long before I realized, wait a second, she's not just doing a little carpool for us. She's really investing in my kids. She's listening to their stories and laughing at their things and being serious about other things and speaking truth into their lives and into their souls and illustrating it with her own experiences from her childhood and lessons that she learned along the way. And I began to hear them refer to her as Aunt Kathleen. So now we call her Aunt Kathleen in our home. And oftentimes she'd also stop and she'd get get them, you know, an ice cream or a little treat or something like that. And, And then sometimes she'll even come inside and play video games with them for, you know, 10 or 15 minutes before she has to leave. Which I really like because I'm not very good at video games. And frankly, I'm not very interested in getting very good at video games. And so, so the other night, Suzanne and I were just talking about how, you know, what a blessing Kathleen is to our family. What started as a simple little carpooling sort of solution is, is become very personal. And she loves my kids. And she cares for them. And I said to Suzanne when we were alone, I said, when we were talking about it the other night, I said, how much are you giving her, by the way? She said, well, we give her this much every week. And I found myself saying, oh, we could do better to give her more than that. Now, why did I find myself saying, give her 
more than that. Because I'm just like you are as a parent. I love my kids. And anybody who comes along and, and they love my kids too, I'm telling you what, I'm gonna love them. You can't even put a price on that when somebody cares about your kid, right? And we were just reflecting, I think she loves our kids and she cares for them. Give her more, give her, because it's the only way we can express thanks to her for doing more than just transportation. You're the same way. I mean, I'm sure it's safe to say if, if, if somebody wants to get on your good side, what do they do? All they got to do is do something good for one of your kids. It's pretty, it's it just something happens in our heart, right? When somebody does something good to our, one of our kids, for one of our kids, invests in one of our kids, teaches one of our kids, you just, a parent loves that person. You're like, what can I do for you? And conversely, if you ever want to get on my bad side, just do something mean to one of my kids. You know, say something mean about them. And that just makes my blood pressure go up. Why? Because I love my kids. And so here's the thought that, that Gary's giving us. Now, apply that love that a father has for his kids to this realm of marriage. The compelling thought that he offers early on in the book is when you realize that you're married to one of God's kids, it will change everything. Just think, men, what would happen if you could realize you actually married one of God's daughters? Wives, what could happen if, if, if you realize you married one of God's sons? It's true. Behold, what manner of love is the Father has lavished upon us that we would be called the sons and daughters of God. See, once you frame it that way, everything about how you view your marriage, it will start to change. Suddenly your marriage is not just any longer about the two of us in this room. No, there's a third one in this room. That's your heavenly father and your heavenly father-in-law. There's an interested third party, you see. So one of my greatest forms of worship to the Lord for the rest of my life is figuring out how do I honor him by taking care of one of his daughters whose name is Suzanne, my wife. Because in his mind, she'll always be one of his little girls. See, we often contemplate the fatherhood of God that's a foundational doctrine in Christian theology, of course, the fatherhood of God. But if you want to change your marriage, draw that analogy just a step further and spend some time meditating on God as father in law as well. This doesn't lessen the direct connection that you have with your heavenly father. It only broadens the, the, the breadth of it. It just makes it bigger. And just to think of it, wow, not only is he my father, but he's also my father-in-law because he created her. He created him as well. And so when I disrespect or am condescending to my wife or mistreat her in any way, I'm not making her my Heavenly Father-in-law, very happy. Ponder this, men. May, this, this thought will bring to life in a new way that you've never thought of it, 1 Peter 3, 7. You remember that verse where Peter's talking about marriage and he's saying, in the same way, you husbands, you must give honor to your wives, treat your wife with understanding as you live together. She may be, the weaker, may be weaker than you are, but she is your equal partner in God's gift of new life. Treat her as you should, so your prayers will not be hindered. You ever thought about that? It's so instinctive for many of us to say, I need to pray for a happier marriage. No, maybe you need to work on a marriage so that your prayers will be heard, so your prayers won't be hindered. See, 
when I'm actively caring for my wife and loving her and seeking opportunities to showcase her beauty to others, I am pleasing my father-in-law on about as high a level as he can be pleased. And I'll tell you one other thing that this mindset will do for you. If you can begin to wrap your mind around this concept, worship of God as father-in-law will help keep your heart soft. And it'll encourage you to move from being the prosecuting attorney to the defense counselor. Let me explain. What if in the midst of your frustration, you tried, instead of just rattling everything off to the Lord that's just wrong with him or wrong with her, well, you can still do that, he can take it. But what if in addition to that, you sat still long enough and said, but now Lord, I want to see with your perspective as to why my spouse is bent in his or her current direction. Help me to see him. Help me to see her through your eyes since you created him anyhow. And he's your daughter. He's your son. I tell you, if you will quiet your soul long enough to hear the Lord, you may very well hear him remind you. Yeah. This is kind of tied into when her daddy walked away from the family when she was still just a little girl. I haven't thought about that in a long time. Or you may hear him say, yeah, this is probably kind of related to his perfectionistic mom who always was nitpicking every little fault, highlighting every little error or mistake he ever made. We tend to forget the marks that come in a person's life from these incidents that happened years ago. And there's healing from them, and we pray for healing from them. But let's not be blind to the fact that in marriage, we're bringing that stuff with us. Like when your spouse's parents divorced, that'll leave a mark. Or when his mother died when he was in fifth grade. Or when her dad lost his job. And the family really suffered as he spiraled into a long season of unemployment. And and she was just in elementary school. Just quiet your soul long enough and ask, Lord, would you please help me to see through your eyes, why is my wife the way she is? Why is my husband the way he is? This is the journey that marriage calls us to. It's hard work. Yes, it is. But it's a journey that we're called to, seeking to understand and to empathize and to become a redemptive partner, a teammate, not an opponent, not a prosecuting attorney against this person that we know so well and who knows us so well. Have you noticed, we, we so readily receive the gospel for ourselves. You know, we, we like the fact that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. We, and when we say us, we mean me. I like the thought that he looked down upon me and my sinfulness and that he sent his only son into this world and said you'll not be able to fix your own predicament of sin and fallenness. And so Jesus comes in the world. He lives the perfect life I couldn't live and he died the death I deserve and he was resurrected from the grave giving me hope. Oh, I like that when it applies to me. But have you ever noticed in marriage how slow we are to also realize, yeah, that while my wife was still a sinner, Christ died for her. While my husband was still a sinner, Christ died for him. We're slow to apply it that way, aren't we? We tend to, and, and you realize what, what, what we're doing when we do that is we're, we're sort of trying to sort of co-opt God onto our side. He sees it my way, right? He loves me a little bit more than you. That's what you're doing, really. If you break it down, that's exactly what you're doing. Sort of like when I was a, a, a kid, I remember at Christmas time, typically uh, our, our family, uh, there was four in my family. I had a little sister, a younger sister. And 
typically at the end of Christmas exchange, gifts uh, exchange and all, dad would uh, reach up into the tree and say, oh, I still see the two little envelopes here. And he'd pull the envelopes out and, and there was usually a little money in there for me and a little bit for, for my sister. And I remember one time uh, she went first and she opened up the envelope and pulls out a, a hundred dollar bill, maybe something like that. A hundred dollars. Wow, mom, dad, thank you so much. She was doing all the right things and I was feeling a little bit like a pill. And so I opened up my envelope and said, a thousand dollars, which of course it wasn't. It was a hundred dollars, just like her. But, and then I said, I always knew you loved me a little bit more, you know, and, and of course the family was laughing and they knew I was just being silly. But this is what I'm afraid that many of you, many of us do in marriage. We're saying, yep, me and the father, <laughs> we pity you, you know, about your spouse. And we fail to realize, no, 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 he's, <laughs> he's your father-in-law as well as your father. Is it too much then for the Lord to ask us to treat our spouses, his sons and daughters, with the same grace that we've received? Now, I want to put one little parenthetical uh, caveat here before we wrap up, just to be clear, because I would not want, particularly after the whole incident with the Baltimore Ravens and everything in the news this week, I would not want any person here to misinterpret what I'm saying in such a way as to explain away abusive behavior, okay? That is not excusable. And, and it's, nor, in, in fact, I will go so far as to say that in a crowd this size, there might well be that happening in a handful of situations. This probably is not the sermon that you need. We probably need to have a talk off on the side of a different kind of nature, okay? Nor am I saying in this message in any way uh, to, am I negating the very real need in every marriage for truth telling, for honest talk, for moments of real confrontation. I'm not saying just sweep those under, well, I just won't say it. No, no, no. There still has to be honest confrontation and, and truth uh, telling. Nor am I minimizing the need for counselors, psychologists, and sometimes medication. Okay? So, so don't hear me to, to be saying something, or oh, he's just, uh, he doesn't understand art. No, 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 I do. But I do think with those uh, caveats sort of set aside, and particularly the abusive one, I, I, which is, gets a category of its own, what we're talking about here is absolutely applicable for all of our lives, for all of our marriages. So what does it mean? Here's what it means. If you're a woman and you married a man dreaming of late, soul-filled discussions and pillow talk and all you got was a husband who's drooling on his pillow at night. Here's how you apply this message. You can take your frustrations to the Lord. He's plenty big enough to handle it. Get your journal out and write every mean thing you need to write. But don't close your journal until you sit quietly and say, now, Lord, speak to me. I've told you everything I'm feeling. But now I'm going to let you speak to my heart because I know that you are his father as well. You're my father-in-law. What do I need to understand from your perspective as I seek to move forward in being the wife that you brought me into his life to be? Husbands. What about if for you, you got married and you dreamed of just sort of happy and easy and was just going to come and you found out, my gosh, she nags a lot and it drives me crazy. Or maybe there was illness in your future and cancer or something and you, and you find yourself thinking, did, you know, I did not sign up for this. This is not what, picture your father-in-law in heaven, your heavenly father-in-law. The day that you were married, beaming from heaven, smiling, clapping, and saying on that day, you don't know what's going to come in the years ahead, but I do. And you're just the right man to be with her, to care for her, to love her, to stay with her 
through it all. I'm so glad that you two are being married this day. I'm telling you, it will change everything if you begin to think of it this way. Now, I mentioned when I started, this message would be relevant for you if you're single. Let me explain to you why. Well, let me quote somebody uh, on our staff when I was sharing these thoughts with our staff earlier in the week. And we were doing our debrief afterwards and they were talking to me. One of the single people said, oh my gosh, really when you think about it, this is like relevant for any person you know who drives you a little crazy. You can apply it to the neighbor. You can apply it to your best friend. You can apply it to somebody at work, an employer, a boss, an employee. Not the father-in-law part, but just the, the realization that behold, all of us have been lavished with this love from our father that he would call us sons and daughters. That's what we are. So when you go into this week, live with this reality on the forefront of your mind. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for the ways that you challenge us and you stretch us, you grow us. Certainly there's no way in which you do that more um, poignantly than in marriage. There's nothing like it that absolutely can take us to the heights of ecstasy and joy and happiness and laughter and contentment and can put us in the pit of despair and frustration and irritability and exasperation and exhaustion. There's just so many different emotions that can come in every marriage and that do come. My prayer, Lord, is that we would take the simple thought of the day and that we would begin to discipline our minds to ponder this thought. And as it soaks in and as we metabolize it, that our actions, our words, even our instinctive thoughts would bear witness to the fact we're looking at this in a little bit more of a mature way than we ever did before. Forgive us, God, for seeing everything always through our own eyes, for being so selfish, for being so crybaby, for being so, it should be easy, and it's, it's all his fault, it's all her fault. Forgive us, Lord. Help us as we move further into this series to open up our hearts, to soften our hearts and our minds to the reality that your gospel, your good news was for all of us. And help us to handle Jesus' name. Amen. Welcome to Postscript from Faithbridge Church. Here we hope to answer your questions and help you dig deeper into the message by sitting down with the teacher of the day. Hi, and welcome to Postscript. My name is Justin Teague. I am the worship and communications pastor, and I'm here with Pastor Ken, who just finished preaching part one of our new series on marriage called Till Death Do Us Part. Thanks for being here, Pastor Ken. Sure. Uh, we've got a lot of Postscript questions that came in. Uh, thanks to those who sent those in. Um, right off the bat, a, a couple of them came in and were asking you to clarify uh, what you mean by children of God. Uh, it, it, they've, they've been taught that there is two different kinds or one different kind. Mm, yeah, sure. Who is a child of God exactly? Right. Are we all children of God? Right. So I think the simplest way to go at it is to say plainly, everybody's a child of God by creation. If you've ever known a human being, God had some role in their coming into this world. So everybody's a child of God by creation. Who's a child of God by recreation? Well, that's where the gospel comes in, that we celebrate as followers of Jesus Christ. The whole concept that God loved us enough that he would come to this earth, live the perfect life, die the death that we deserved, rise from the dead, that we could be recreated by faith. And so 
Um, and, and, and really, that is the trajectory of uh, 1 John, is the child of God by recreation. I didn't go into all of that, and I don't think we're doing a disservice or an injustice textually to say, yeah, but this concept of the father-in-law that really applies to anybody. Certainly, it, it is consistent with some passage, a passage I'm thinking of in First Peter, where the wife is, t Peter's talking to wives. What do you do if your husband's not a believer? Well, don't pack up and leave. Don't divorce him. Love him. Stay faithful to him. And maybe your winsome witness will bring him to faith. So I, I think it, it, it's not asking too much to, to, to push that word picture that Gary gives us in the book of the father-in-law, and just to realize, okay, everybody is a child of God by creation. Hmm. And it won't do us any, uh, let's put it positively, it, it'll only help us to conduct ourselves in every interaction pondering that reality. That's great. And now this an analogy actually came out of uh, Gary Thomas's book that's that right. we're preaching from. Yeah. Life uh, that you're preaching from, I'm not. I'm preaching. Uh, Lifelong Love that's in the Resource Center. Yeah. Um, you were telling me before there's a couple illustrations actually connected with father-in-law uh, analogy that you just didn't have time to talk about today in the sermon. Sure. Well, a very touching one uh, from his own life. He tells the story of how this concept, the, the, the picture of God as father-in-law, really just came to life for him. He reflected on how uh, years ago, I think he and Lisa had been married at least 20 years when this had happened. He recalled his uh, rehearsal dinner and his father was teary-eyed and expressing gratitude for how wonderful a man that his daughter was gonna marry and, and all of those warm sorts of things. Well, roll it forward 20 years and his father-in-law, Bill, w was on his deathbed of some sort, sort of terminal illness, as I recall. And Gary says it was, it was a, a very tender moment. He, we were talking and he said, Gary, just at this point, pray for me to, to go on. It is well with my soul. And you know, he trusted the Lord and he knew the Lord and everything. He said, I just, I just am ready. And, and Gary r wrote about how in that moment, he said to his father-in-law, Bill, I just want you to know that what um, I committed to 20 years ago, you can still count on. Mm -hmm. I will always be here for Lisa. I'm gonna be a faithful husband. I'll be caring for her and loving her and everything. And so you can check off your list of worries that you need to be concerned about her, you know, as he was getting ready to, to finish up life on this side. And I just found it very touching as, as Gary sort of told that story using sort of bookends of the 20 years, of the rehearsal dinner and, and then the deathbed. Hmm. It's powerful. It is a powerful illustration. It it's is. touching. Uh, it can also be, it, it can be painful uh, for someone who is, is single or di sure. divorced. divorced. Sure. Uh, and then there are other people who, who, who might be saying, okay, what, now when are you going to talk about uh, in-laws or sex uh, sure. or money and debt and things right, like that. Right, And even one other one, uh, when you were rattling those off, I was thinking about the spiritual mismatches yeah. that are in the congregation. People, you got one Christian and one non-believer. And they write in cards, how do I do this um, as well? So what we did, knowing that we only have three weeks, and you can't cover everything in every single series. And so what we did is we loaded up onto the website, faithbridge.org um, slash, I think it's the sermon link. And, or is it the marriage? It's uh, slash marriage. Slash marriage. And that way you can actually get some of the messages that we've done on those very things. How do I survive a spiritual mismatch if my spouse isn't a believer? What about divorce? What about singleness? Talk to me in my singleness. Uh, what about uh, sex in, in our marriage and how should that work? And, and uh, what about in-laws and, and navigating and finances? That's another one that, that marriages struggle with a lot of times. So we just tried to go back and load up a lot of good things knowing there's no way we can cover all those in this series. Great. What, now, what are we covering? we got two more sure. great sermons coming right. up. What's coming up next well, Sunday? Well, let's talk about next Sunday. Pastor Dan will take the baton next Sunday, and he's going to go in a very 
practical direction, and he's going to talk with us about perseverance. How do we persevere in this thing uh, called marriage? Awesome. Thank you, Pastor Ken, for joining us for another Postscript. And thank you for joining us for another Postscript. We'll see you back next week with Pastor Dan. Thanks for joining us for Postscript. Help us keep the podcast interactive by submitting your questions during the morning services. Learn more at faithbridge.org forward slash postscript.